Woo-woo! Come on, Quaker! Come on, Quaker! Good morning, family! Good morning, Good morning church! Let's go, Quaker! Let's go, bro! Together on this Valentine's Day morning, Sunday morning. It's super good to Hello. be here. Uh, guys, it's so amazing to get a chance to preach the word to our super region. Can you all hear me? Yes, sir. Come on, Quaker! We're here Let's with go, Quaker! Amen, amen, amen. Oh, bro. Here, you, listen, bro. today is Valentine's Day. And I, I got to be honest with you, uh, whenever it's Valentine's Day and the preacher gets up to preach, uh, I don't know about you, but I'm expecting him to open his Bible to 1 Corinthians 13 and to teach us about love and tell me that like, love is patient, love is kind, yeah. love doesn't envy and convict me about my sin and the fact that I'm not chasing the true love of God. I'm expecting the preacher to get up here and tell me they're like, hey, the real love you should be going after is the agape love, the unconditional love of God. But then sometimes we sit there and we listen and we're like, I don't know if that's what I really want to hear. Come on, bro. I know this because many of us grew up on Disney movies. Come on, bro. Where you have the protagonist be it a man or a woman and there's a love interest and it always ends in the happily ever after. How do I know? Because many of us spend thousands of dollars watching movies that are termed the romantic comedies and they are some of the biggest blockbusters every single year. Why? Because that's what we want. We want those love stories. We want the fantasies. We want to read the book. Many of us, if we're honest with ourselves, our favorite movie is The Notebook. Yeah, I'm watching. Cap, cap. That's not true. And for many of us, all of the TV shows that we watch has a singular element in it. There is a love interest. How do I know? Mm. Because the people who write the TV shows and the movies know if you don't put a love interest in there, nobody's going to watch it. Nobody's going to be interested in it. And so many of us have either read the books or watched movies like the Twilight series books with the love triangle right over there. Or if I could say a name like Ross and Rachel, everybody knows what I'm talking about. Or for those of you that may be a little bit older, Sam and Diane. Or for the new Gen Z people, Sheldon and Amy. Yeah, see, everybody's nodding because everybody knows what I'm talking about. Because yes, on, we all want the happily ever after. We all want to end okay, up with Quaker. the one. We all want to end up with our soulmate. And when it's Valentine's Day, that's what we want to talk about. Don't throw the first Corinthians 13 in my face. Somebody would tell me, well, aren't there three different Greek words for love? Phileo, the love between brothers and friends or between siblings or family members. Agape, yes, unconditional love of God and Eros, the more romantic kind of love. Why don't we ever talk about Eros, the more romantic kind of love? And somebody will say, well, actually, in the Greek New Testament, there's no mention of the word Eros. However, you and I know that the concept of Eros is in the Bible. There's a whole book dedicated to it. It's called Song of Songs. But don't worry. We're in a mixed company, so we're not going to be preaching through the book of Song of Songs right now. Thank you. Like, Yay, mix it up, bro. Thank you. But I do understand. That's the kind of love we want to hear about on Valentine's Day Sunday. And the Bible tells us in Psalm 18 that God stoops down Yes, to make us great, but God loves to come and meet us where we're at. In Philippians 2, the Bible tells us that Jesus humbled himself and taken the form of a man because he wanted to know where we're at, what we like. And so today we're going to talk about the kind of love that we want to hear about. And the title of our lesson today is Love Story. Go with me to Proverbs chapter 30. Oh, okay. Come on, bro. Oh, okay. I love it. Love Story. Come on, Proverbs bro. chapter 30. We read these words in verse 18. There are three things that are too amazing for me. Four that I do not understand. The way of an eagle in the sky, the way of a snake on a rock, the way of a ship on the high seas, and the way of a man with a maiden. Love story is what we're going to talk about today. In Proverbs chapter 30, it's an incredible, incredible passage. It's written by the most wisest guy who ever lived, Solomon. He writes all these Proverbs, and he's like, you know what, let me tell you. There's a few things that amaze me. There are four things that I don't understand in all of my wisdom. The way of an eagle in the sky. And someone would be like, well, currently, we've actually figured out how birds fly. Strike that off. Okay. 
the way of a snake on a rock. How do snakes slither? It's like, yeah, we got that down. And some of us are like, I ain't even interested. Like snakes, they're just slimy. Okay, strike that off. The way of a ship on the high seas, like, dude, we have cargo ships, we have Navy. I don't want to hear about that right now. But the way of a man with a maiden, when a man sets his eyes upon a maiden and it makes him feel feelings he's never felt before, and it makes him want to do things that may be considered crazy and dangerous, but for that moment, it just looks awesome. That's what we're going to talk about today. Love story. Okay, Terra Media Ecclesiastes, chapter four. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Ecclesiastes, chapter four. In verse seven, the teacher writes, again, I saw something meaningless under the sun. There was a man all alone. He had neither son nor brother. There was no end to his toil, yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. For whom am I toiling, he asked, and why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? This too is meaningless and miserable business. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their work. If one falls down, his friend can help him up, but pity the man who falls and has no one to help him up. Also, if two lie down together, they'll keep warm, but how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. This is an incredible Come on, text. Quaco. A text that we use in marriage counseling to help people understand that this was the intent of God all along, not for man to be alone, not for woman to be by herself, because two are better than one. It's a miserable business, it's a miserable existence for a person to be singular by themselves. And we're like, yeah, I'm all about that. Let's talk about the love right up in here. And it says, yeah, consider it. If a person has a partner and he falls or he stumbles, his friend or his partner will pick him on up. If two lie down together, they'll keep warm. But pity the man who sleeps by himself and is shivering in the cold. Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. And we all smile because we're like, yeah, that's what yeah, we're yeah. about. And he closes up by saying, a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. And like all the marriages will tell us, yes, he says a cord of three strands because yes, the one strand is the man and the other strand is the woman and they found love together. And the third strand is that of God who's binding them together in the committed relationship. This is the love story that God designed. And this is how he did it when he created the first man and woman, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. That's how it started. A man and his partner, a man and his wife, a man and his spouse in the paradise of God. There was no sin, no impurity, no compromise, nothing that would bring a tear to their eyes. The book of Genesis says that there was no shame, there was no embarrassment. And that's how God intended for them to live permanently in a committed relationship. And how do we know that Eve was Adam's soulmate? Well, they were destined to be together because there was nobody else out there. Solid. <laughs> Small pond, huh? And that's what's been planted deep in yep. all of our hearts. I'm looking for the one my soul yearns. The one I was destined to be, my soulmate. Our first point, the story of us. Go to Hosea chapter one. Come on, bro. This love story, beginning with Adam and Eve in the Garden of, of Eden, is what God intended. That we would be together, we would find the ones that our hearts desire, and that God himself would be the third strand right there, tying us together in that committed, permanent relationship, that we'll find fulfillment with one another and with our God, and we'll be surrounded by paradise. But you and I know what happens. Sin enters that pure garden and everything falls apart go to hosea chapter one we read this passage here in chapter one verse two when the lord began to speak through hosea the lord said to him 
Go take to yourself an adulterous wife and children from faithfulness, because the land is guilty of the vilest adultery in departing from the Lord. So he married Goma, daughter of Deblame, and she conceived and bore him a son. Skip with me to verse 6. Goma conceived again and gave birth to a daughter. Then the Lord said to Hosea, call her Lo Ruhama, for I will no longer show love to the house of Israel that I should at all forgive them. Yet I'll show love to the house of Judah and I'll save them, not by bow, sword, or battle, or by horses and horsemen, but by the Lord their God. After she had weaned Lo Ruhama, Goma had another son. Then the Lord said, call him Lo Ami, for you're not my people and I am not your God. This is the story of us. Beginning in the Garden of Eden in all purity, where God intended for him to be the third strand that tied us together, sin enters it. We're unfaithful to our God, and because of our sin, the paradise, Eden, is destroyed. And God gives Hosea an opportunity to live through the very experience that he himself went through. He's like, Hosea, it is like taking onto yourself a woman who's going to be unfaithful to you. It's like attempting to build a lasting, committed relationship of love with a woman who will not stay with you. Come on, bro. That's the story of us. Come on, bro. That from birth, God desired to be in relationship with us. A pure love where he desires nothing from us, but to give us everything. A pure relationship where he desires to protect us, make us feel secure. A desired relationship where he wants to take us to be with him for eternity. But because of our unfaithfulness, Eden is destroyed. Paradise is lost. We're unfaithful to our God, just like Goma is unfaithful to us, her husband, Hosea. And she bore his children so much pain that God says, Lo ami, I am no longer your God. And you are no longer my people. And you have to wonder, well, how do we get here? It's because although God desires to be our all in all, we have chased after pleasure rather than the peace of God. We have sought after Mr. Right Now and not Mr. Righteous. We have chosen Miss Available Today and not Miss Always and Forever. Ooh. Hey. Because we I'm want to something else. And God continues to make his appeal to us time and time again that this is our story. Go to Ezekiel chapter 16. Dang. Come on, bro. Come on, Kweku. Tell us our story, bro. Preach, bro. Go, Quakes. Ezekiel 16. God says in verse 4, On the day you were born, your cord was not cut. No, were you washed with water to make you clean? No, were you rubbed with salt or wrapped in cloths? No one looked on you with pity or had compassion enough to do any of these things for you. Rather, you were thrown out into the open field, for on the day you were born, you were despised. Then I passed by and saw you kicking about in your own blood. As you lay there in your blood, I said to you, live. I made you grow like a plant of the field. You grew up and developed and became the most beautiful of jewels. Your breasts were formed and your hair grew. You were you who were naked and bare. Later I passed by, and when I looked at you and saw that you were old enough for love, I spread the corner of my garment over you and covered your nakedness. I gave you my solemn oath and entered into a covenant with you, declares the sovereign Lord, and you became mine. I bathed you with water and washed the blood from you and put ointments on you. I clothed you with an embroidered dress and put leather sandals on you. I dressed you in fine linen and covered you with costly garments. I adorned you with jewelry. I put bracelets on your arms, necklace around your neck, and I put a ring on your nose, earrings on your ears, and a beautiful crown on your head. So you are adorned with gold and silver. Your clothes were fine linen and costly fabric and embroidered cloth. Your food was fine flour, honey, and olive oil. You became very beautiful and rose to be a queen, and your fame spread among the nations on account of your beauty, because the splendor I had given you made your beauty perfect, declares the sovereign Lord. God says, this is the story of us. This is how we began. I found you kicking about in your own blood because you were despised at birth, no one would spread love upon you. And what's amazing is this is the world in which we live in today. Orphanages are full of kids whose parents did not either love them enough to take care of them or didn't want the responsibility of looking after them. There's so much loneliness, depression, and insecurity, even in a world that's 
population is growing and growing and growing. Why? Because we are all alone because no one loves us. That our hearts are not even deep enough to be able to love ourselves and be able to extend love to another. And it's in the midst of this that God says, I passed by. I saw you kicking in your own blood. And I said, live. I rescued you. I pulled you out of the darkness into the light. I made an appeal to you to come back to what I created you to be. God washes us with water, signifying what? Baptism. And he says, I clothe you with an embroidered dress. I put leather sandals on you. And he clothes us and he makes us the jewel of his eye. He is fighting to return us to the paradise from which we have fallen. But how do we repay him back? Verse 15. But you trusted in your beauty and used your fame to become a prostitute. You lavished your favors on anyone who passed by, and your beauty became his. You took some of your garments to make gaudy high places, and where you carried on your prostitution. Such things should not happen, nor should they ever occur. You also took the fine jewelry I gave you, the jewelry made of my gold and silver, and you made for yourself male idols and engaged in prostitution with them. And you took your embroidered clothes to put on them, and you offered my oil and incense before them. Also, the food I provided for you, the fine flour, olive oil, and honey, and honey I gave you to eat. You offered us fragrant incense before them. That is what happened, declares the sovereign Lord. God says, you trusted in your beauty. We trusted in our own wisdom, in our own pride, in our own talents, in our own arrogance, and in our own independence from God. We figured, I can do this on my own. And we turn our backs on God. God says we are prostituting ourselves to Satan and to the world and to everything it's offering because we've turned our backs on our maker. Come on, bro. This is the story of us. It breaks our hearts every time we study the Bible with people. Mm. And you come to the light and darkness study and people get open about the terrible darkness they've lived in. The sins they've committed, yes, and the sins that have been committed against them, the abuse that people live in, and we can see that what God is saying as our story is true. You see it on the television every single day. And in the midst of all of this, the words of God ring true. This is your story, yes, but it doesn't have to end that way. The curtain doesn't have to close this way. We can make it back to what God intended from the beginning. We can make it back to the true love that he offers us, even from the beginning. Come on, quick. Come on, bro. It was so amazing. I got an opportunity to uh, have a conversation with our brother, Carlos Mejia, who leads our church in Mexico City this week. And he was sharing about what a challenging week they had this week. And I was like, bro, what do you mean? He's like, "A a few more disciples in the Mexico City church got COVID and a few others died from COVID. And he says, it's sad to see a disciple pass away from COVID, but we celebrate their life, why? Because they died faithful. But in the midst of this, one of the disciples' sons got COVID. And this week they took their own life. They committed suicide. And he said, It's crazy to think that people in this world, because of the pandemic, have no hope. Because of the abuse, because of the sin that they are living in, there's no hope. They're taking their own life. So on the one hand, we can celebrate the life of disciples that are dying faithful because they have hope of eternity. But we can look, we can see the terrible darkness in our world. And God is crying out for men and women to rise up and do something about it. The same way he's been doing since the beginning of time, that we will align ourselves as his disciples and say no more, that we will go into the darkness and we will say to people, live, there's a way out of this. 
super proud of the disciples here in this church that even this week we saw three incredible men and women get baptized in San Jose, we saw Dwayne baptized into Christ. We saw Sydney this morning baptized into Christ. And also here in San Francisco, Eric was baptized into Come Christ on. this morning. Come on, let's go. And it's awesome because we are reaching out into the darkness and we're giving hope to people. Yeah. Come on, bro. And everybody can come into the light and then help somebody else. Brothers and sisters, the challenge before us here as a church is fruit for everyone in 2021. I want to call on all of us to go after it. Make it a personal goal. Make it a Bible talk goal. Make it a household goal. Make it a ministry goal. Let's be brothers and sisters who hold each other accountable, who help each other to be fruitful. Let's look at everybody in our Bible talks this week and say, how many of us in this Bible talk have been personally fruitful this year? Let's fight to see everybody in this Bible talk fruitful this year. Why? Because we want to see fruit for everyone in 2021. Because there's too many people dying in darkness. Come on, thank you. Dying away from God. Our second point, you belong with me. Come on, Kwaku. Chapter three. Come on, Kwaks. Come on, bro. Let's pick it up here in chapter two of Hosea. In verse 14, declares the Lord, therefore, I am now going to allure her. I'll lead her into the desert and speak tenderly to her. There I'll give her back her vineyards. I'll make the valley of Accor a door of hope. There she will sing as in the days of her youth, as in the day she came up out of Egypt. In that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband. You will no longer call me my master. I'll remove the names of the vows from your lips. No longer will their names be invoked. In that day, I'll make a covenant with them, with the beasts of the field and the birds of the air and the creatures that move along the ground. Bow and sword and battle I will abolish from the land so that all may lie down in safety. I'll betroth you to me forever. I'll betroth you in righteousness and justice, in love and compassion. I'll betroth you in faithfulness and you will acknowledge the Lord. Our second point, you belong with me. God is so amazing that even in the midst of our darkness, he still makes the claim to you and I, you belong with me. That even though you turned your back on me, even though in your pride and independence you think you don't need me, God still says you belong with me and he's willing to do whatever it takes to bring all of us back to him. He says you belong with me. And so here in Hosea chapter 2, he says, even though Israel had turned his back on him, he's going to lead us to a desert praise and allure us until we're in love with him again and we're singing songs of praise and rejoicing to our God. And not only that, he calls Hosea to play it all out in his life as well. Go to chapter 3 of Hosea, verse 1. The Lord said to me, go, show your love to your wife again. Though she's loved by another and is an adulteress, love her as the Lord loves the Israelites, though they turn to other gods and love the sacred raising kings. So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and I bought a homer and a lithic of barley. Then I told her, you are to live with me many days. You must not be a prostitute or be intimate with any man and I will live with you. As God does for the Israelites and as God does for mankind, he calls on his prophet Hosea to do the same thing. He says, go and show your love to your wife again. Even though she's been unfaithful to you, even though she has turned to other gods and she is being intimate with somebody else, go and show your love to her again and bring her back. What's incredible about this passage is that Hosea has to go and buy his wife back for 15 shekels of silver. A woman that he had married and he had a covenant of marriage with, she had been so unfaithful that she had ended up in sexual slavery. He had to go buy her back. And God says, go buy her back. Because that's how much God is willing to demonstrate his love for us. 
that he's willing to pay whatever price and do whatever it takes to win us on back. And that's what he did by allowing his son, Jesus, to die on the cross for you and I. God says, you belong with me, and I desire to be with you so bad that I'm even willing to sacrifice my son. Jesus looks upon you and I in our fallen state and says, I love you so much, and I know you belong with me so much that I'm willing to sacrifice even my own life rather than see you condemned to hell forever. And he tells Hosea, go, buy her back. And Hosea says, I'm buying you back and you must live with me for many days, but you must not be a prostitute or be intimate with any man else. It's not free grace, which sadly, many, many people may be preaching. God is willing to do whatever it takes to win us back. He's willing to pay whatever price to get us back. But he's saying to you and I, you must repent. You must change. You may not be intimate with anybody else, but with me. You must live with me for many, many days. God understands, just like it says in Proverbs 19, 22, that what a man desires is unfailing love. And even though it's a cliche, it's true. Deep down, what you and I desire is unfailing love, but we have searched for love in all the wrong places. And the true God who never fails makes a decision to come after us, to deliver us, to rescue us, to save us, no matter what it takes. And he's willing to bring us back onto ourselves. It's so awesome. Last year, we saw over nine brothers and sisters restored to God. This year already, we've seen over uh, three brothers and sisters restored. And it's always encouraging to see a restoration because you and I know what happened. It was a person just like God says in Ezekiel who was rescued out of the slavery of the darkness and brought into the kingdom. But unfaithfulness and sin got back into their heart. So they turned from God and they walked away. But God, just like Hosea, is willing to go and buy them back. And bring them back. And so when a person gets restored, we rejoice because we get it. God is willing to lay down the red carpet and get them back. And if I think about all the brothers and sisters who've been restored this year and even last year, my heart goes out to those that haven't even come back. And I want to put a challenge before all of us as brothers and sisters. Let's make a decision that this week we're going to call a brother or sister who fell away. And just tell them to come back on home. This week in our Bible talks, let's call a brother or sister who fell away in our Bible talk, either last year or this year or the year before, and just tell them to come back on home. That we don't care what they've done. We don't care what made them walk away. We just want them to come back home because, yes, they belong with God, and so they belong with us. Are you with me, church? Come on, bro. Yes. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Go. Turn to Matthew chapter 22. Our third and final point. This is our psalm. Matthew 22. Let's go quickly. Come on, bro. In verse 1, Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent some more servants and said, tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened cattle have been butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. He sent to his servants, the wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. Go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, both good and bad, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. When the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. Friend, he asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few 
are chosen. This is our song. In Matthew 22, Jesus tells a parable, which we know as the parable of the wedding banquet. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who is preparing a wedding banquet for his son. And from the top, we all get it. The king is God. His son, obviously, is Jesus Christ. And what's his wedding? He's the bridegroom. The church gets to be the bride. And he sends his servants out to go invite everyone to come and celebrate the wedding banquet of his son. But people are too busy. They got better things to do. Satan has deceived them with the thorns and the weeds of this world. And they don't have any time for God. So the servants come back and they're like, the people you invited don't want to come. And he says, go to the street corners, invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out into the streets and they gathered everybody they could find both good and bad, and the wedding banquet was finally filled with guests. Why? Because God is opening up the invitation to everybody. It doesn't matter what background you have. It doesn't matter, according to the Bible, if you're a good person, bad person. No, no, he's inviting everyone to come. And so everybody receives this invitation, and they show up because they're like, well, I've never been to a wedding banquet for a king's son before. I'm willing to go. There's grace available. There's mercy let us go to the amazing grace. But the king comes on in. And as he's meeting guests, he sees a man there who's not wearing wedding clothes. And he says, friend, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? Because even though the invitation was free, there was an expectation for all who would show up. There's a responsibility. It's so sad that so many in this world today have been sold a cheap grace. That God will take you just the way you are. He knows you're evil. He knows you're sinful. You got nothing to change, nothing to repent. Just come on in. And yes, it's true. God is inviting everybody to come. And he's willing to take you. But he calls on you to repent, to change, to put on wedding clothes. Why does he put that on us? Because he wants you to celebrate and participate in the wedding banquet of his son, Jesus Christ. He calls on you and I to be clothed with Jesus Christ. That if we receive his invitation, that we will repent, that we will get baptized. And yes, indeed, have the gift of the Holy Spirit placed upon us. Why? So we can be clothed with Christ. That's what it takes <laughs> to be in the wedding supper, the wedding banquet of Christ. Come on, bro. It's not just for us to walk on in there just the way we want. What blows me away is this is our song. It's a wedding song. It is God trying to unite you and I with his son, Jesus Christ. And it says in Isaiah 62, verse 5, as a young man marries a young woman, so your builder will marry you. As a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so will your God rejoice over you. God rejoices over us when we receive his invitation, his amazing grace, and we make a decision to change our lives and be united with him forever. When all of us make a decision that God is inviting us to his wedding, he wants us to participate. So we make a decision. I want to be there. I'm going to repent. I'm going to put on the wedding clothes so that I too can be there at the wedding supper of the lamb on that final day. That's the song I want to hear. I want to hear the wedding song oh, of the Lamb. Turn with me to Revelation 21. Come on, Quakes. Come on, bro. It says here in verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, now the dwelling of God is with men and he will live with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There'll be no death or mourning or crying or pain 
for the old order of things has passed away. This is what God is looking forward to. The wedding day of the bridegroom Jesus and the bride, the church, you and I. He's waiting to make all things new, to wipe away all the tears, all the mourning, all the crying, all the pain of the old order. He wants to wipe it all away so we can finally, once and for all, for all eternity, be united with Jesus in heaven. And that's the vision that John saw. That's what we're looking forward to. That's why we live our lives according to God's word, so that we're clothed in wedding clothes on the final day. Look at verse nine. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and said to me, come, I'll show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God and his brilliance. It was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates, with 12 angels at the gates. On the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. There were three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, and three on the west. The wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. An angel sneaks over to John and says, dude, come, come, let me show you the bride. Don't you want to see it coming down from heaven? He goes, and what does he see? It's a great mountain. It's the kingdom of God. It's the church of the living Christ. This is what God wants you and I to be a part of. This is what we celebrate every Sunday when we get together. But it's not just for you and I to be a part of it on this call today. God wants the invitation to be given to everybody on this planet and the responsibility is on you and me. You and I have to have the enthusiasm and the passion and the desire that the angel in verse 9 had, the seven, one of the seven angels, he's like, dude, come, come. Let me show you the bride of the lamb. Let me show you the holy Jerusalem. Let me show you the kingdom coming out of heaven. That's what our hearts need to be because that's what our song must be. We need to go to everybody we can talk to and say, come, let me show you the kingdom of God. Let me show you the mountain that has been prophesied from generation to generation. Come and see it. Because the wedding of the Lamb is upon us. When I read all these passages about a wedding, you know the couple that comes to my mind is Gary and Cindy. Gary and Cindy are such an incredible couple here in the congregation. And their marriage is such an inspiration to each and every single one of us. Their story is a wedding story that many of us want to have, that they were actually baptized on the exact same day, hundreds of miles away, Gary in Los Angeles and Cindy here in the Bay. And when they met, they were like, what? You were baptized on the same day as me in the same ocean? It was like a love story written by God. It's the stuff that movies are made of. It's the stuff like a romantic comedy where we follow Gary's life and you know he's a guy running around in South America speaking Spanish you know playing his music because he's musical and then there's Cindy here in the Bay Area really working hard at her life and we're like wow what is God gonna do what is the writer of the movie gonna do to get these two together and then they meet disciples they study the Bible on the exact faithful day in the exact same ocean they are baptized and the camera pans from Gary's baptism to Cindy's baptism and everybody watching that movie has a twinkle in their eye because we know what the director is going to do. One day they're going to meet and they're going to realize that from the day they were born, God was preparing their love story. But it's not just about Gary and Cindy. It's about you and me too. From the day we were born, God was writing our love story. And it's our love story with him. That every moment of our life, he tailored it. Every path we took, he set us on. Every door he opened was to direct us. And every door he closed was to redirect us. So that one day, we'll be standing before our groom, 
looking at him with love in our eyes as he says, well done, my good and faithful servant. This is the story I've been writing since the beginning of the universe. And I'm glad that you're here. But on that day, we will not stand alone. Because as the Lord says these words to you and I, we will cast but a glance around to see all our spiritual family who are here to celebrate with us. And you know what we'll notice? They are also celebrating their love story with Jesus. They too are standing before the lamb. They too are the bride. They too are hearing the words, well done, good and faithful servant. And in that moment, we'll see that what a grand love story it was. That if we're still on earth, we would pay 200 bucks to go watch it in the theaters. But this one won't cost us $200. No, no, no. Because it's the story we've written with God. And to God. Be all the glory. Come on, Quaker. Yes, bro.